Welcome to the Santa Cruz Coffee Break. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, please follow, hit the like button, or any subscribes. It really helps us with the algorithms. Santa Cruz Coffee Break is produced by the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum. All opinions are those of the speakers. We invite you to join us on the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum at SCGCPF for more fun. Now, let's get on with this installment of Santa Cruz Coffee Break. Well, we'd like to welcome everybody to the 54th podcast of the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum. And back for uh, another round of abuse is Eric Skye. Um, Hello. Eric, <laughs> Eric is, uh, uh, we'll catch up with him a little bit about a sold out show in uh, Seattle this weekend and some other stuff. But Eric's going to talk with us about how to practice today. Yeah, I think it was Wes Montgomery said that he just opens up the case and throws in some meat. <laughs> <laughs> so is this, is this, um, does this tie into your 30 day challenge or is this uh, something new you want to? Well, no, I mean, the 30 day challenge was, that was quite a while ago. If people are not aware of that, just uh, an old student of mine, back when I uh, hit the 30 year mark for uh, private teaching practice, they said, you know, why don't we, film a bunch of just sort of short video essays on different topics. And I don't remember if I talked about practice, but I think my feelings about practice, um, you know, are probably spread out through that, that whole thing. You know, I think part of what's, I don't remember much of what was said during that 30 day guitar challenge, whatever. I certainly don't go back and look at anything or listen to anything I do, but, but, um, you know, I think the general gist of it was just, um, you know, how to get better, um, you know, without new chords or new tablature or new songs or whatever. It's just, you know, more about the uh, Yeah, right. Well, it's just just the actual sort of, you know, mental part of the music making process, I guess, and, and things to practice and some technique. It was a little all over the place. But yeah, in general, I think it, it dovetails with the idea of just as practice as a lifestyle. You know, I, I've always admired musicians like I think Sonny Rollins comes to mind, you know, who would be like, I think there's a quote, I'm, I'm completely making this up, but something like, you know, he's like 93 years old. People are, you know, why are you still practicing? He's like, I'm getting better, you know? Um, or even just in my own life, my, my duo partner in Los Angeles, uh, Mark Goldenberg, he's always inspiring me. He's just completely um, a student, you know? And, and, you know, and for those that don't know, I mean, he's just, you know, he's on plays with only the the best of the best and all the all of the you know he's been on the movies and tv and all that stuff just an amazing player and every time i practice or i talk to him he'll tell me he's practicing stuff his new teacher uh gave him and he's always getting like different kinds of teachers and stuff and so just sort of forever the student and um you know i admire that and um you know that's how i think of my life is i'm just kind of always working on music not necessarily trying to get better i mean most i'm just trying not to get worse <laughs> at this point but most i'm just trying to get different you know and just 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 thinking of new ways and looking outside myself to find you know new ways of putting things together and so anyway just it's a lifestyle <laughs> yeah well and we should say that anybody who hasn't watched your 30-day challenge um should it's it's not i wouldn't approach it as a challenge but as a series of 30 short lessons that you can just use to improve your personal skills, abilities, open you up to ideas that maybe might not have had. Um, and you're offering it for free, which, you know, nowadays yeah. that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I think I got the word challenge. I mean, I think that's just sort of a, a, a clickbait <laughs> thing. I think, I think at the time I was doing like this 30-day um, yoga challenge or something. I got a like day four and dropped out, but I like that idea. Um, yeah. Anyway, I mean, so when it comes to practice, you know, since I've been teaching for 500 years now and, and then I'm sort of my own student, you know, I'm, I, I have this, uh, you know, just have the lifelong learning bug, you know, I just uh, with music and, and other things, I just, you know, again, as a lifestyle. But I think it's sort of important to really think about what practice is, you know, to differentiate between sort of and, and it gets a little squiggly in here, but to differentiate between practice rehearsal, you know, and sort of playing and performing those, those three things, um, overlap quite a bit, you know, in my head anyway, um, you know, like the difference between 
practicing and just playing and i'm using the word playing here i don't know i'm sort of tying it in with performing but i'm i'm just thinking about the fun of being a guitar player you know um because like sometimes i'll have a a, a student come in and they'll say i practiced for two hours yesterday and then after a few questions i start getting a picture that you know they got a new amplifier and they were twiddling around with the knobs and then they kind of played some riffs that they've known all their life and then you know and jammed a little bit and then you know, maybe uh, maybe they're even including a half an hour on the laptop, you know, researching, you know, tubes from Russia or something, you know what I mean? And that's all fun. And that's that's a great part of what it means to be a guitar player. And I like that stuff, too. But that's not the same thing as, you know, this um, sitting down with intention, you know, and ideally a list of things that you're trying to do. Um, and moving the ball down the field in a consistent way. Those are two different things. And I think, so step one is to sort of differentiate. When am I working at what I do? And when am I just enjoying what I do? You know, and, and when, the more you can kind of separate those things, maybe the better, you know, because it's, it's really easy to um, conflate them in our, in our mind and just think of it as one big blob. Um, I was thinking, you know, not my favorite, person I always agree with, but David Brooks in the New York Times had this great quote once. It said, successful creative people think like artists, but work like accountants. And um, I find that's true for, for, for some of the great artists that I'm lucky enough to know. And I find it's true for myself when I feel like I'm moving the ball down the field that, you know, when I sit down to practice uh, or rehearse, you know, I'll try to differentiate between those two. But you know, I have I have list. I have a thing on a you know, it's on a piece of paper. It's it's alphabetized. Um, I can even get color coded, but it's more likely you know. So so for example, what I usually tell people is even if you never plan to do a gig or make an album or do those things that we think of that professional musicians do, um, make a set list or make an album list. You know, just if you um, let's say you wanted to play. Um, Fiddle tunes, you know, I think we can all agree in that in that world, in that community of that style of music, you know, there's probably like, I'm just making this up, but maybe like 30 frequent flyer tunes, you know, the tunes that you should know, and maybe you pick 20, because that would be two sets of 10, that would be bad, you know, that would be great, right, that'd be a great um, starting point. And then so you write them down on a piece of paper, <laughs> and maybe alphabetize, and then maybe next to that, you can write like the tempo that you practice them at. And you can write notes about, do I know the melody for it? If you do, do you know the melody in other places, you know, other octaves? Do you know the chords? Um, you know, and these are things that you can have on a piece of paper, and then you kind of know where you are in your, uh, in your set list, you, where, where you are in the development of your ability to play in your set list, I should say. Um, but that way of thinking and that way of working and having on the piece of paper has always been um, great for me. And maybe that's really obvious, <laughs> but for a lot of people, no. it isn't like their repertoire is just sort of up in their head and it's kind of all over the place, but it can get very, very detailed again. Like, you know, where are you putting your capo and just all that stuff, just treating it like, well, put it this way. The reason I feel so strongly about this is, you know, I've had enough experiences in this life to know that deadlines are a thing. <laughs> you know, if you're going to be on TV playing guitar, you know, six weeks from now, um at some point you know the the rubber is going to hit the road you know the plane's going to leave the runway and you're either gonna you know blow it or not <laughs> you know i don't know that's probably a hardcore example but you know, if you have a gig coming up um you want to have these tunes together and so how do you um you know how do you plan for that how do you go through methodically it's kind of what i'm getting at I, that that's that's really a really important because I play off, I practice off a set list, you know, okay. of songs that I know. And it's funny because I dig back into them and I kind of like almost play the set list when I sit down the first time, I kind of play them all, you yeah. know, and then, and then kind of go back and go, okay, so I did this or I did that, you know, let's try this. But I, I love the idea. It's, I, it's almost like a spreadsheet. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. That's, ex that's what I kind of wanted to say It's like a spreadsheet. And sometimes it, it, you know, it is because there's, I'm just going to continue to use fiddle tunes as an example, but you could substitute jazz or singer songwriter stuff, I imagine, but all I, you know, you're talking to me today. And, you know, I mostly exist in this world of sort of instrumental 
uh, guitar music, you know. Um, sorry, I got derailed there for a minute. <laughs> oh, so um, <laughs> so and I'm gonna just you know talk with those about those styles. And so I have several lists for um, the different projects I'm involved in. You know, Jamie Stillway, Mark Goldberg, my solo things when I play with Tim and stuff. And you know, they're all organized on my computer. But I can actually kind of go through this because um, Jamie and I, I think you said, we didn't actually play in Seattle, but we were on the the Washington coast for a performing arts center. And then we had a great show in Portland the night before. But the point is we haven't been playing a long time and we had a couple shows and I knew they were sold out and we had to kind of get our act together. So I can sort of describe that process for you, which as you say, is like playing through the set list. But um, I always tell my students that um, I think it was uh, the great uh, jazz pianist Bill Evans that said the big shift happened for him when he went from working on 24 tunes in an hour to one tune for 24 hours. And I think there's a sort of a hybrid between that. So usually when I'm looking at the list, so I think Jamie and I had like 14 tunes on the list. So we printed them out, didn't put them in any order or anything. And, and you know, we might make substitutions on the fly, but in general, that's the game plan. And um, if I look at that list of 14, I'm just saying hypothetically right now, but I might see six of them that like, you know what, no problem. <laughs> you know, just if I don't play these, I, I, you know, I'm very confident about uh, you know, the memorization of the chord chart and being able to play the melody in several different places. And then there's like maybe another four or five that I'm like, you know, <laughs> something good could go wrong in this. I don't know if I always remember that B part or I always botch this thing or whatever. And so those go to the top of the list. And those are the ones that get the sort of second half of, of the Bill Evans saying there where I call them like the, you know, like the tune of the day, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I might play through the whole list, um, but but there's always one on the front burner, right? You know, just kind of go through the list, reminding myself of the basic parts and stuff, making sure I got them. But then there's the one tune that I'm going to really uh, drill down on. You know, I'm going to put on the ironing board and just kind of go over and over those wrinkles. Um, and, you know, that's always been uh, pretty effective for me. I mean, this is improvised music. You know, <laughs> it's it's not... You know, I'm not like a classical musician where I'm trying to remember, thank God, you know, where I'm trying to remember some complicated thing from beginning to end. You know, I'm just trying to get, you know, the outline um, and have the, you know, the melodies down and, and so on. Does that make sense? It does. <laughs> it does. Yeah, completely. So, completely. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I'm just trying to think about what I normally do and there are a lot of times where you know i may be saying to others i'm practicing when in reality i'm just effing around you know i i will pull up my ipad which has all my charts on it and i'll randomly select some letter in the alphabet and just start there and just start you know playing through songs but i it, not with the kind of um determination um that you know would probably be appropriate for a practice session um i think the only time i really try that is you know playing with a group of people in the band we we do a lot of vocals and there are three or four songs where i'm lead and so those ones i pay a lot of attention to because i know that if i screw up it's going to be painfully apparent. well there you go that's my point that's that's the <laughs> that's your i'm on tv now mode yeah. <laughs> you know this is the part this is the part where if you screw it up then you got to wear the dunce hat for a second or two in people's minds, right? You know, yeah. Um, well, yeah. So, you know, I think just to people listening out there, um, just attenuate whatever I say to, <laughs> you know, to your situation. Not everyone's going to be, you know, doing gigs and, and, and making records and stuff uh, or have a lot of time, you know? So just get the gist of what I'm saying, if, if it interests you <laughs> and, and just kind of, you know, have it meet you where you are. Um, but this shift in, you know, intention, you know, of having this kind of um, focused work, it, it's hard, by the way. <laughs> I can tell you that um, it's rewarding. Uh, it's very rewarding. I think Picasso said that, 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 that working on art washes away, washes the soul, from the dust of everyday life, you know, or washes the, <laughs> the dust away from you. Anyway, I'm screwing up my 
Picasso coat, but you get the idea about um, <laughs> about this whole thing. There's a a, a really interesting book. I, I, I'm sure you've seen the inner game of tennis thing. Yeah, that that whole thing. Uh, Barry Green has the inner game of music. Okay. And he's talking about kind of exactly what you're talking about is when you've practiced and you've done all that stuff and then you get on stage, you need to like revert to that inner self to allow that to just do what it knows how to do. Right. Versus you being forced. Oh, I, I gotta, I gotta play this. You know, I, 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 it, it just flows. Yeah. It, it, so it's really, it's really interesting. I, I, I breezed through it the first time I read it and then I went, Whoa, I, I got to spend some more time here. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to look at that. And that that thanks for saying that, because I, I realized, um, you know, I got derailed on trying to remember a Picasso. Quote, and now I remember where I was going, um, which is an, uh, one of my heroes who's not really um, I don't know hero is not the right word, but a guy that I really admire. He's not a musician at all um, is Cal Newport. He has a book that I've read three times now called Deep Work. Um, he also has um, a book called Digital uh, minimalism and a world without email and a couple other things. And you can see the kind of connections there and we can circle back to those, but in deep work, you know, he really talks about how challenged we are to do that, particularly in day society, society. But, you know, before I mangled the Picasso quote, quote there, my, you know, intention was to show that if you can get there, it is a really rewarding place to be, you know, to, to sort of work hard at something. Um, it's my favorite part, you know, um, my dad was an artist, you know, and I, I grew up seeing him in, in the early morning light, you know, doing the easel thing with a cup of black coffee, you know, in his case, a cigarette, <laughs> you know, and uh, I always thought that's my favorite part of art. You know, it's the standing in the gallery in a sport coat and shaking hands and drinking wine part that I'm not so good at. But um, I really love, you know, the, the, the early morning morning walk and I find it work <laughs> and uh but I you know I find it really re rewarding and um so anyway that's what I'm kind of preaching is but it's a hard it's a hard place to get to and especially now you know it's um I think we all know that the absolute brightest minds the wealthiest people that have ever lived are in the business of trying to get our attention um, and that's absolutely true. <laughs> Google, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all of that stuff. It, it's almost like a shift in, in human consciousness. So I think, you know, we're not, you know, in the classical era where you just have to sit by your candle and there was really nothing else to do, you know? Um, so that can be the hard thing is just sit down and, and set that time. So what works for me for the more intentional side of practice is mourning. Um, I, I like to, for a while I was saying that, like, I just pretend it's 1974 every morning it, you know, I try not to look at, I mean, I do have to post things and stuff cause it's kind of my job to, you know, do, to be visible, I guess, in a way, but I try not to do anything after that. Then I make some tea, you know, this morning I made a fire and, you know, that's my time to, to really practice. And then after that, it's, you know, it's whatever. But that's a way of kind of getting in that distraction free zone in the book deep work he talks a lot about a, a lot of famous writers and whatnot and all their different kooky methods for getting themselves you know out of the out of the mainstream day stuff you know and into a, another room in the house or in some some cases maybe even a room you know, or, or a little house in the back or something like that where you can be undistracted and really kind of work on this stuff do you do you have your practice schedule set up rigidly? I mean, do you make it a point of having an absolute kind of frame of reference that you dedicate to practice? It it changes. It it's usually thinking month by month, and um, you know, uh, like everybody else, I'm kind of um and maybe i'm dragging my feet a little bit more than other people but you know like getting back to like doing more gigs and performing and stuff so a lot of it is dictated by that so again like having a couple sold out shows last weekend uh coming up on the calendar 
you know, um, the month before <laughs> and seeing those that then I really got in kind of a, a rehearsal mode. If I'm not so much in that, um, then I'll sort of make something else on the front burner. So it's sort of rehearsing, like I was talking about earlier, looking at the list, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but then there's also just sort of working on guitar playing, um, which actually is a good time to sort of transition into the concept of you know, using your repertoire, which is your set list, whatever that is. Um, first of all, understanding repertoire, because I can't tell you how many, I'm going to do some air quotes here, quote unquote, you know, advanced uh, jazz guitar players that all come come into my office for lessons. And they're, they're amazing. You know, they, they, they know every arpeggio and every mode and, and, um, you know, they have a expensive arch top, you know, all the things, you know, but don't know, know any tunes, you know, if you, if you don't have tunes, what I mean, it's, you know, it's like if you're a painter, but you haven't, you know, you don't have like four or five framed paintings, you know, I mean, this is the thing that we're making is is repertoire is a set list of tunes. Um, so it's just really important to think, you know, that's, that's the main thing. And then therefore, that's the bucket that all your uh, practice in terms of becoming a better musician, say, working on your time or your tone or, or, you know, so for example, and all of that should get folded into repertoire. So for example, if you heard me say something like, um, hey, every time I play, um, you know, I don't know, a diminished chord, I like to play the diminished seventh arpeggio, you're like, wow, that sounds cool. I'll, I'll look that up. But what you really want to do, and that's great, you know, I mean, and practice it, whoops, um, but immediately think what in my set list can I fold this into? Um, because then your brain has a reason to really encode it, right? It's like when you were a kid and you learned a new word. Um, it sounds cool, but out of context, what is it? You know, your brain doesn't have any reason to hold on to it until your teacher looks at you and says, use it in a sentence. <laughs> Right um, now, suddenly, you know, there's a reason to hold on to it. So any th new thing you learn, fold it into your repertoire f somehow, if you can. And if you can't consider just putting it aside, you know, depending on how organized you are, you can have just just like a lot of composers or writers of tunes, whatever. <laughs> not sure what the difference is there. Um, I think it has to do with beer drinking, but, um, you know, we'll have like a scrapbook of just like incomplete ideas, you know, and, and that can be a thing, you know, so maybe you don't need to learn all the modes of the whole tone, whole tone scale, you know, uh, so you could, you know, set that aside for now, um, but maybe it's someday it'll come up, you'll, 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 you'll find the, the perfect tune or whatever, but try to fold stuff into what you're doing, um, you know, and, th and that goes for like technique kind of things, if you're working on your technique, um, or your posture or your timing, you know, obviously get that into your set list. When I'm going through my set list, I mean, my metronome is always on the two and the four um, because I don't want to just practice like where my fingers go and making pitches. That's, that's half, or I would argue a little less than half of what music is, right? I also have to be sort of um, feeling the time, you know, being consistent and having some sort of groove. I'm not saying I always have those things, <laughs> uh, but the degree to which I do um, is about that. So it's, you know, the cliche of killing two birds with one stone. I mean, you can go through your set list very slowly with a metronome on the two and four, if that's your jam. I, I, I endorse that pretty heavily myself. Um, and then, you know, really mindful of your of your technique, because guess what? You don't have to, if, if you do do gigs, now's the moment. You don't have to worry about, you know, people looking at you, not sounding right, lights in your eye, you know, all the, the stuff that kind of makes you nervous. Now is the time to really kind of, you know, go inward and, and get into the Zen of really controlled, relaxed movements in your technique and having that, that, that groove and that time right there helping you out. You know, that's the time to practice this stuff. And if you are someone who does play gigs, um you know and and perform then i don't always do this by the way <laughs> i don't always practice and preach but when it gets close to gig time it is good to like actually practice in a chair as opposed to a couch because surprise surprise i haven't played a gig yet where they've put a couch out for me i would take that gig <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um but you know if you think you're going to be sitting um in a folding chair for two hours trying to play your solo guitar repertoire Sometime before the gig, you might want to give that a shot because that's the kind of thing that can throw the whole thing 
off or if you're you know uh, i don't know but if you're like an electric guitar player if you haven't played standing up in a while and the big gig involves you standing up i mean that would that would that would be impossible for me at this point i don't I, but um but anyway so practicing within the context of when you might actually uh make the music is is probably a good idea too as you get close to the thing you know if you're just gonna um be a couch potato with the guitar which i totally endorse um which I do a lot of, then that's that's fine. You know, I, I got to say, I really like that approach of, of learning how to use something uh, because I can't think of, I, I can think of a lot of times where somebody has shown me some cool chord shape or some interesting little run or something, but nobody's ever said, okay, now you got to try and use it in a song. And, and, you know, that stuff disappears very quickly. It's like, oh yeah, I'll spend the evening practicing getting my fingers in the right shape. And the next day it's like, what was that again? <laughs> yeah, and my message on that is like, it, it, and if you don't find a home for it right away or it doesn't really float your boat, then just let it go because that ties into a big, bigger message here that like one, I think a shift in me probably like 25, <laughs> maybe yeah, about 25 years ago, it's just really thinking like, what do I want to do with music? You know, because you can't do it all. You know, I mean, I've made some jazz records and, you know, um, made some flat picking records now and some contemporary finger style. And I feel confident in those styles to a certain degree, but, you know, and I've spent my whole life doing this, by the way, and I'm not 20 anymore. Um, but I know for sure I'm going to die a shit flamenco player, a shit country player, a shit rock player. Like this thing is as deep as the ocean and I'm looking down and I'm only seeing about two feet in, you know what I mean? Like, so I just say that because our temptation is to want to pick up every, pick up every shiny object in the road. I could do this. I could do that. I could buy a telly and a cowboy hat. And, um, and, but I think if you want to take one or two things, um, you know, farther, then it's good to really think, well, what do I, you know, not just what am I attracted to in the moment? Or what do I, I get the message from other people I should be into? Um, and this, this, I'm still kind of in the back of my mind, still talking about little, like, you know, scales and arpeggios too. You got to know this, you got to know that. Well, do you, does that really resonate with you? Does that really work? I think when I sort of figured out that, okay, I'm only going to live once, it seems to be going by pretty damn quick. So I really like the acoustic thing. Um, so I think I'm just going to forego electric for the for this lifetime now. Um, in, this is, you know, again, attenuate what I say for yourself because I'm pretty ADD. So I find that if I just focus, I mean, I just focus on just literally the one guitar. Um, so, but that kind of keeps me more focused. So there's kind of more to do in a small area, you know, like expansion through limitation. Um, but really, I think musicians that are serious or want to get into deeper work with it should spend some time on the mountain, as it were, and think about what music really resonates with me and, and you know, what sort of approach to that music really resonates with me and then try to, you know, it's, it's okay to go, I mean, it's more than okay. <laughs> In my mind, for me, it's okay to kind of be wishy-washy and go back and forth, but I still try to keep coming back and resist all the the temptation from the distraction war <laughs> that we're all in with screens and stuff um and just you know kind of stay in that um you know stay in my lane i guess and and that's that's made it really helpful but again you know just just be yourself i think that's the most important thing figure out what that is and be yourself um and then you don't you, then you'll be able to resist that temptation of you need to learn everything and every key or every you know just figure out what really works for you Anyway, I hope that makes sense. I don't think it's so much of a temptation to learn it. I think it's more of a frustration that you can't play it. You know, oh, why can't I play that? I must stink. You know, when you think about, I think about Muddy Waters, mm -hmm. and I think he played in two keys. You know, all those songs, there's capos, there's all kinds of stuff going on, but he's basically playing the same four chords all the time yeah and he was pretty good he was pretty um, good yeah he, he yeah I only, right. when i'm playing the flat picking traditional music i only play in three keys 
yeah. then kind of moved the campo, the capo, <laughs> the campo, the capo around. Um, yeah, I mean, again, expansion through limitation. You can, and and yet there's all these fiddle tunes, and you can do so much with that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's I think that's totally fine. Um, kind of going back to what I was saying, I, there's a good Miles Davis quote that it takes a long time to sound like yourself. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm I'm over preaching this, but you know, trying to figure out what that is and and drill down on that. That's like kind of my main piece of piece of advice, I guess. Um, and just actually do the thing is something that I tell students a lot too. Um, this kind of gets me back on the the high horse of the attention thing, which by the way, I'm totally addicted to. <laughs> you know? So I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just projecting here, but doing the thing is the important thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's so easy to just kind of get addicted to kind of maybe watching tutorials on things, you know, like watching people talk about, um, playing guitar and watching other people playing guitar. I mean, that's all important. You're researching new amplifiers and it's just so easy to get caught up in that and then realize, wow, I'm not actually making music. I'm just kind of thinking about music, talking about music, researching how other people make music, researching the tools other people make music with. I mean, my God, how many books would you write if you were obsessed with other people's typewriters or who makes the best typewriter or, you know what I mean? Um, or I guess dating myself, no one, no one uses a typewriter. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but these are all things, you know, that, that I do too, but you've got you at least compartmentalize them as like, this is the distraction. It's not actually doing the thing, right? I mean, the kid that grew up uh, in the pool hall <laughs> is is always going to whoop your ass if you're just the guy who just watches people play pool on YouTube and and stuff. You know what I mean? Like you got to get in there and do the thing. Um, so it, it kind of comes back to that uh, uh, discipline to do uh, deep work if if that's your thing. You know, there's one uh, amplifier company that has modifications for um, pretty commonly available amps. And in their instructions, after you've done the resistor and the capacitor and all that stuff, he says, play your guitar. Yeah. Don't research it. Don't, don't keep looking for stuff. Play it. And yeah. then decide if you want to go to this thing or go that thing. But you have to play it. You know? Yeah. You, you, you got to play it. You just got to sit down and play it. Yeah. It's so... Yeah, it's so true, but it's, you know, again, uh, this is the last time I mention it, <laughs> but, you know, this this attention war is going on. I, I just don't think we realize what an inflection point we are just in sort of human development. But, you know, right now, at any given moment, the easiest, softest thing you can do is this look at your phone and, you know, see who else is on, you know, on vacation or whatever. I mean, it's just like... It is so now more than ever, it's just easy to kind of, and especially with, you know, music and stuff, it could, it, with, with gear and other people playing and, and, you know, tutorials on this and all of that. And it's just so easy to get kind of lulled into that, that somehow is practice. Um, and, uh, and it's not. So it brings me to another point, which is listening to music. So I do think that there is, you know, I'm talking about deep work and stuff, and I certainly don't want to paint a picture of myself as a monk or you know or that i'm that that innocent and i would say also calvin newport differentiates between deep work and shallow work and shallow work is important that's stuff that needs to get done too you know it, it, it just and while i'm doing things like that i'm kind of being wishy-washy here but like if i'm doing something around the house or something i almost always have actually these headphones on and i'm listening to music and i think listening to music is also practice it's sort of passive in a way but it's really important and um i'm just gonna you know just say for myself my own experience has been uh, i love headphones and i, I love how everyone's kind of listening in, <laughs> in headphones now um you know back when, when when we were young of course our friends and us probably all had decent stereos and we would sit in our bedrooms and actually listen to music so that's almost basically not on the menu for anybody now so now we're kind of coming out of this dry period where no one had stereos or sort of decent headphones and now it seems like everyone's sort of listening to things on on their phone and it's a really great time to have like 
an immersive experience, I think. Um, so, you know, there's times like morning walks can be really good for really listening. Um, you know, some sort of situation like driving long drives by yourself. So there's a difference between sort of, you know, anyone who's been married for any <laughs> length knows there's a difference between hearing and listening, right? So, you know, you can have music sort of on the background or if you're in a club, you kind of see music and that kind of lights a fire in its own way. But I, I really feel like there was a period when I was um, a teenager that I had big headphones on and I would listen to like Alex DeGrassi records or West Montgomery records or, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin records or whatever, and just like listen to the whole record with headphones on and eyes closed, you know? And I think that that's how my brain got encoded for like kind of what music is and what it, what, it, what it's like to be in the moment in the music and, and in the long thread of music and not it's just something happening on the periphery, you know? And I think that that kind of wired my brain to be able to do some of this. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but you can still kind of have that experience by listening to albums, but, you know, trying to find it you know, it, I mean, I put on music too, and I have guests over, you know, and maybe we have a martinis or something, but that's, that's not remotely the same thing of having um, the sort of a immersive time. And, um, and that can get fun, you know, you can start researching what are the best, let's say you're into, um, you know, I don't know, jazz or something like what are the top 10 jazz albums or something. And then maybe you'll discover kind of blue or, or something like that. And just like, listen to it, 10 times, you know, listen to it for 10 days in a row. Um, and uh, you can't come out of that without being somewhat reprogrammed because it's, it's really important to learn music or to, uh, I don't know how to put this. I, I think Martin Hayes, the great Irish fiddler um, talked about playing, learning and playing music from the inside out. Okay. And not so much from the outside in. So for example, like the Suzuki method, when I was a kid, uh, well, when I was young, I knew kids <laughs> that that did that, right? Like you would um, um, send a kid home with a cassette, a new violin, <laughs> right? So give your five-year-old a, a violin and a cassette tape of someone playing uh, Twinkle Twinkle. And you're supposed to play that cassette tape, you know, I'm just winging it here, but four or five times at breakfast, four or five times at lunch, four or five times after uh you know, after after school, bef after dinner, before you go to bed, the poor kids hearing Twinkle Twinkle, you know, 16 times a day for five days, you haven't even give don't give them the violin yet. Then you hand them the violin. And wouldn't it be amazing if he didn't kind of like figure out <laughs> how to play Twinkle Twinkle, because that's been so deeply encoded, right? And we can kind of do that. You know, if you if you're like, hey, I think I've always wanted to make my own solo guitar uh, arrangement of autumn leaves. I would say make a playlist of autumn leaves or maybe just find the one, but I don't know, make a playlist of like five people playing, uh, five eight favorite artists playing autumn leaves and just listen to it for four or five days. And, and so you've listened to this like 25 times. So a, a little bit, people I think underestimate, you know, how much musicians, you know, will drill down on stuff like this, you know, I think I think a lot of amateurs will just think, yeah, I'll just play this thing for two minutes, whereas somebody else might be like, no, I, I can play this one scale for like 20 minutes, you know, and the difference is huge, right? So if you can listen to something over and over consistently and then sit down with a piece of paper and your guitar, it's still going to be a challenge <laughs> to, to <laughs> arrange autumn leaves. But think about how now you're playing from the inside out. It's 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 in there. It's in there. It's always in there. Uh, improvisation. I was when I'm teaching improvisation. The first thing I tell everybody is like, can you can you hum Twinkle Twinkle? And they're like da 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 da. Never play a music instrument in their life. Maybe they'll, they'll they can hum it. I said, did you ever see? Um, uh, the Jungle Book, when they had that, isn't the Jungle Book where they have that great sort of uh, all the scat singing? Can you scat sing it? You know, they'll, they'll be like, scat singing? Yeah, just pretend you're, you know, scat singing. And you're like, okay. Congratulations. You can play bebop. It's in your brain. It's in your brain. Can you get it to come out of your hands? You know, that's what I mean by playing from the inside out. So, Lots of lots of listening 
um, is how you can kind of program yourself to do that. Does that make sense or am I getting too weird? <laughs> no, it makes sense, but you know, uh, thinking about it, I can remember back in the olden days, you know, that it was harder to hear music. It wasn't as available as it is now. And you had to make an effort to, to find an album or if a friend got a new record or something, you know, it was like, oh, this is my chance to hear that. Nowadays, you know, it's all on your phone and yeah, I don't need to listen to it now because I'll find some time and I'll listen to it because it's all on my phone ready to go. Um, and I don't think we appreciate it as much. Conversely, like you say, nowadays it's very easy to find, you know, a half a dozen versions of Autumn Leaves to listen to. Whereas, you know, a long time ago, you might have been lucky to have found one. Um, and to hear yeah. it, you know, in high quality. Yeah, so that's where I would, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I was going to push back on the first part and say, I still think the, the old days were better because in this one way, I, I, do, I do think things are better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I do think the old way was better because if because we were more reverent about the music that we did have, right? And so if you had one, if you, all you had was Revolver, but there's nothing else happening, right? You don't have Instagram and, you know, while you're trying to listen to Revolver, right? You're, you're sitting in front of the, in my case, you know, I, mo I grew up in Pennsylvania, everyone had a big lawn and I was really young when I figured out that I could charge people like $10 to mow their lawn and I saved up enough money and my dad met me. My dad did not make a lot of money. So to this day, I think about this a lot that he met me halfway. I somehow came up with 500 bucks and he matched me 500 bucks, which I, I now know was just a shit ton of money to him. And really hard and i'm just like ah i don't i don't want to talk like this it gets me all worked up but and we bought a fisher stereo and 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 you know it's just this big giant silver box of goodness with two big wooden speakers and a room that was smaller than this one and i you know I, i'd invite my friend over like i've got this album you should come and we're gonna sit in my room and because there's nothing else to do we might look at the cover. That's the only distraction. We might look at the cover for, I don't know, 45 minutes. <laughs> and um, and we're just going to listen to it. So it's, it's you know, not to belabor the point, but it's back to that um, immersive experience. So you now you can have that now and, and, and take advantage of the riches, riches <laughs> uh, of being able to find five different versions of autumn leaves or probably 7,500 versions. But, um, but you know, just have the discipline to know when to then shut off the the, the fire hose, right? Um, you know, we all have these channel changers, but we, we when we're trying to watch three seconds of 500 channels, you know, so just find something to listen to. <laughs> and then, and then that's why I've said, like, a lot, a lot of times in, in a variety of ways in my life, I like to pretend it's the early 70s <laughs> until about lunchtime <laughs> and at lunchtime i'm ready to rejoin you here um it's just um anyway hopefully that made sense oh yeah yeah no it, it's it's like when you see people advertising televisions that can do multiple picture in picture it's like why yeah that's I mean, consciousness yeah. right now <laughs> yeah yeah, right. So that brings me to another point, uh, or sort of, you know, some clarity on the concept of playing from the inside out, and that is memorization. Um, I think that's always been a hard one for me, and I conveniently have the out of being uh, someone who plays instrumental, largely improvised music, but I still have to have the chord changes memorized and the melodies memorized, and and I try to remember some of the things that I consistently come back to doing in them. Um, and I, I find that that, um, you know, as someone who's taught guitar forever now, that's always a weak spot for people. And frankly, it's a weak spot for me. Um, but a real turning point was, I think, I don't know, a long time ago, I realized that if you put a piece of sheet music in front of me, just a lead sheet, just, you know, like, just let's go back to fiddle tunes, a simple fiddle tune, whiskey before breakfast, got the A part, the B part, it's really only 32 bars, it's really only 16 unique bars. You. You can put that in front of somebody and have them play it from top to bottom for like four months, you know, <laughs> and then 
and then say, hey, you ready to play whiskey before breakfast without the paper? No, I need, I don't have it yet. I need a little bit more time. So, and I'm the same way, you know, um, if you just read something on a page from top to bottom, you know, at least for people with a small brain like me, like it just takes forever to memorize. So I really feel strongly that you want to from, you know, not day one, because you do, at first you, you're looking at a piece of paper, whatever it is, new diagrams of exotic Carpaccios, whatever the hell it is, you're looking at it and you got to, you know, look at it for a bit and get it inside you. But, but, but as soon as you're sort of comfortable, start the memorization process, which for me is sort of two things. One, it's um, just going sort of phrase by phrase, you know, don't start working on phrase two until you can play phrase one. I know that's like, you know, whatever, but just do it. Wean yourself off the paper, have the paper turned over. If you need to go and look, you go look, whatever, but just kind of go phrase by phrase. Um, but the second thing that's really important is for me personally, singing it, and I don't sing. This is not an attractive thing on the outside, you know, like I don't actually, but here's the thing. I feel like memoriz memorizing music is a fairly, and again, I'm just talking from my own brain, is a fairly esoteric thing, right? It's like you can convince yourself that you've memorized the notes, but if you really memorized an entire fiddle tune by thinking G, A, C, back to G, a D note, an E note, that'd be like memorizing an 800 digit phone number, right? I mean, I can't do that. Um, or thinking it's the first fret, then the second fret, and then the open string. Again, that's like an incredibly long string of code. You're not really doing that. But it's in there. It's mixed in there. I think the guitar is very visual, like the piano. I can't see the larynx. Is that how you say it? In my throat. So I do not. I do not think singing is a visual instrument, for example. But the guitar is like right there in front of you, almost like a piano. And so I do think that we sort of have images of what it looks like, even if your eyes are closed, of how to play a tune. Um, so that's a part of it. So it's kind of the mixture of like this coding stuff of the, the names of the notes or the locations of the frets or whatever, um, and the sort of what it looks like, but mainly it's what it sounds like. Cause surprise, surprise, music is art with sound, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, so the more we kind of really focus on that, the better. So I think that's the main way that we're filing it away in our, our brain. Like our brain is, is gives priority to like uh, wave files or MP3 or whatever you want to say. These are audio files, right? So when I'm learning a tune, I'm, I'm making myself make dumb sounds like da, 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 <laughs> just use whatever a consonant and a vowel and just sing that melody. And when I do that and kind of go phrase by phrase and wean myself off a piece of paper, I can usually memorize a whole tune in about half an hour. Um, but just to clarify, you know, later that night, I'll, I'll try to play it and I'm like, oh shit, I lost half of it. And then you go back, but that time, the, the next time and the time after that, like the process gets really tiny until when you learn tunes like this, then you'll realize one day that, you know, Jamie might call a tune on the gig. And I honestly haven't played this tune in a year. I'm like, yeah, I think I got it. <laughs> you know, cause I, I think I put it in the filing cabinet up there in a way that it's more accessible than me trying to remember what it looks like printed on a page and the classical musicians i mean hats off i i don't even know you know how they can like memorize this whole long bach piece but once you have a tune memorized and the reason why i'm yabbering on about this is you know now you can if you were an actor now you can be the part right the last important percentage of music is you know, your time and your tone and your phrasing and your inflection and your dynamics, that's, that's what brings it to life, right? It's not just where you put your fingers. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, those are the things that bring it to life, right? And you can't, I believe it's really hard to do that, um, you know, without having memorized the tune. Again, I just like, who, who would go to, who would pay top dollar for the big Broadway play where they're all walking around with the script in their hands? <laughs> Um, you would assume that they've internalized it so they can play it from the inside out, you know? Um, so memorization plays a really 
big role, but it's, it's a it definitely falls under the category of deep work because um, it's a pain in the ass. You know, it's hard, um, but you know, it's it, fun. When you bring, when you say that, it, it makes me think that there there are kind of two ways I I admire and possibly evaluate air quotes real musicians, and one is those who have the technical skills and the technical abilities on their instrument um, that, you know, you just, you listen to them play, you watch their fingers move, you know, whatever else. And you're just in awe of the, the technical skill that they have with the instrument. The other one is, as you said, it's memorization. People who you can, somebody can call out a song or something and they, they'll just launch into it. They'll know the chords pretty damn well, but even more importantly, they know all the words. And I mean, I've, I've heard singers that, you know, I don't know how they get through a whole show without having the words in front of them because they do so many songs and it, it's mind boggling to me. Um, at one point I had an employee, she couldn't sing worth a damn, didn't play music but she knew every word to every song that ever played on the radio. And you could try playing something or singing something while you're working or something. And she'd be like, no, 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 the line is, and she'd have it down pat. Yeah, my guess is she'd listen to the radio a lot. You know what I mean? Oh. Like, 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 and I'm a big, um, this is kind of an interesting avenue to go down to a little bit, just, you know, why are we practicing you know i mean if you if you don't have a gig you know or whatever i mean what what is it we're all practicing for and again it's that that lifestyle maybe that you love you just just the love of learning and continuing to work and i said earlier you know that i've been doing this full time forever and i you know i still feel like i'm i'm scratching the surface so the whole cliche about like there is no there there you know it's the journey but that it's so like most cliches. I mean, there's, there's a lot of truth in there. And then, and, and so it's don't get too hung up on what it means to be quote unquote good. I mean, who, what it means to be good is, is for you personally to be, cause you're going to be your main audience for you to be satisfied with what, with, with what role it's playing in your life. I think for most people, the role music plays in their life is just wellness. You know, it's like, this is your time out of the, the mainstream of adult <laughs> world if you're an adult you know and and now you're you know it's 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 this this time away and so um just celebrate that i guess is one thing i'm saying but you know also not get too hung up on what it means to to be good or whatever because i think people get discouraged like i'll never be able to do it or there's these people who can do it easier than i can i do believe i think it was malcolm gladwell that's you know got into the whole ten thousand hour thing and i do buy into that because i do think talent is overrated i mean obviously if you want to be a you know a horse jockey and you're my size <laughs> then that's you know that that might that might not be good um or if you're really you know four foot tall and you want to be a basketball player there's certain sort of you know, physical things, I guess. But I think if you have, you know, 10 fingers and a love of music, you can you can become the best that that you can be. Um, but the people who really excel at this really do put the time into it. Because sometimes people say, I, I've been a, you know, I've, I've been a guitarist for 20 years. Well, you know, 20 years is an interesting, like that's a, that's a big container <laughs> you know? and a lot, you know, a lot can happen in there. So did you like play guitar? A, a big, you know, did you have a period? Most of the really good players, again, I hesitate to define what it means to be good, but, you know, really great accomplished sort of players that I know, jazz, classical players and stuff have gone through some period of of heavy immersion, like crazy. And I'm, I'm no different. There was points in my life where I played guitar like eight, 10 hours a day. Um, just about, you know, people are always, you know, I'm just kind of riffing a little bit on the 10,000 hour book, whatever, Talented is Overrated that you know, he goes in that book, which some people disagree with, but in that book, he talks a lot about dispelling myths of people like Tiger Woods and stuff, who's by the way, father, who sounds like a nightmare, had him just doing sand traps over and over and over and over again when he was, you know, little tiny kid and stuff. But a lot of times, you know, you'll see these kids that are really great and it's because they're in a time in their life that if they chose to play guitar for eight or, or saxophone or whatever, uh, for eight or 10, 12, 
hours a day, they can do it, you know? And so most of the really good players went through that. Um, you know, I put some, some, some value to the fact that some people have maybe, you know, stickier brains, <laughs> like they, the, your friend who memorized a million songs. I, I also marvel at that. Although sometimes I think my own brain, like I memorized a lot of tunes too. So it's just, that's her gig, you know, and this, and she might be blown away by the fact that you've memorized whatever it is that, you know, you, that you've got in there too. But some people probably do have stickier brains. I'll say something, uh, I hope it doesn't come off wrong, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, having taught for all this time, I've taught a lot of people who are like, you know, like very successful doctors and lawyers and stuff. Um, and I will say that I think we can all agree that to become a successful doctor, you gotta be pretty smart. You know, you gotta be, you'd have to know a little bit about, um, you know, getting information into your head keeping a lot of information in there, organizational school, skills and stuff. And I have to say, on the whole, when most of the doctors, lawyers, sort of high functioning people, um, they learn really fast. I'm sometimes amazed that they've come back and like, oh, yeah, I've, I've got 10 of these tunes now. I'm going to try to take a solo, you know. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, some people might have more neuroplasticity going on or something. I know I don't. So you don't have to. <laughs> but um, and some people might have faster or slower twitching fibers in their fingers. You know, I see some of my friends like um, uh, uh, James Nash, you know, like uh, I've played with James and I just, I just think he's the most, like his fingers are just, it's, it's fun to watch, <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's not so fun if you got to take a solo after him. <laughs> I'll go first, <laughs> you know, and so maybe he has, well, I, I know what he has. He's, it's like anybody else. He, I, I mean, I haven't talked to him about this, but I'm sure he's, he's had that period of just total immersion and, and the, the, the routes that he's taking on the fretboard, he's traveled a million times, but, but also maybe he has some faster twitching fibers and stuff. Anyway, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm going down the rabbit hole here, but just to say that we're, you know, you're all you got, <laughs> you know, <laughs> everybody else is taken, <laughs> you know, you can't become West Montgomery, <laughs> you can't become Aldi Miola, you can't, you know, um, but you can become the best that you can be by put, doing the hard work that you, in the time that you have, um, and you can spend time, I'm wrapping up, believe it or not, <laughs> yeah, like you can spend time kind of narrowing down what kind of musician you want to be, you know, how much time do we really got left? Sorry, but it is a healthy way of looking at life. How much time do we got? And, you know, so what's important? And, and how, you know, how much can I dig into that for my own satisfaction? I mean, if you don't have to play at a gig, you don't have to do it record, just just think of it as this, you know, the love of learning. And uh, anyway, that's how I practice, <laughs> or how I think about practice. Um, I, I think that's great. I, I, the one thing I would throw in there, it's the one thing I've learned and I've only learned this recently is um, playing with other people and getting feedback from other ears, other people listening to you play and saying, you know, this is right, this is wrong, that's good. Uh, try this a little differently um, is really useful. And even better, having a teacher, somebody who can stop you and say wait you don't have that right i know you think that's right but that's not quite right and to, to really help you that just whether it's a friend or a teacher having another set of ears um to listen to what you're doing and provide you feedback on it um i've just found to be invaluable yeah i'm glad you said that in fact maybe i'll finish with a quick rapid fire of miscellaneous things that you can do if you want to become a quote unquote better guitar player and uh you're absolutely right getting a teacher or a mentor or a playing partner certain styles of music like i've been keep talking about fiddle tunes or jazz tunes is another one where that's very community oriented just if you live in a big city chances are you can find a gypsy jazz jam or something where everybody knows how to play django's castle and minor swing or whatever and you can get together and 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 make music with people that can be really really inspiring and and always try to play with people who are better better than you um and then take take lessons with someone that you admire i think that that really helps uh i will say as a teacher i think you get the most out of a teacher if there's something about them that you admire like maybe you're you know you really want to 
I don't know, whatever it is, like you like the way they, they, what it is about them, their style, their records and drill down on that. I think if you want to learn how to play, um, you know, Stairway to Heaven or something or, or whatever it is, like you can probably find that in tablature on a book or but, but what makes that person unique and try to figure it out and ask them like the hows and the whys and stuff. Or if you have players that you can play with it that are really great. When I play with Mark Goldenberg or Jamie Stillway, um, like they, they, I, all, I mean, Jamie just left here a couple of days ago and it just has me like, once again, I'm like, oh man, I really need to think about my technique because she has such amazing technique. And then she has such great ideas, like, like really long threads of ideas. She's not just randomly cutting and pasting. This will work, this will work, this will work, but really taking that melody and, and, and just going long threads and stuff. And so just being around that for a couple of days kind of lights that fire. You know, I think as musicians, uh, we need to just figure out what's going to give us, you know, that nourishment to, to encourage us to, to want to do the deep work. Um, but yeah, so getting a teacher, um, you know, listening to music. I, I've been harping on things like, you know, YouTube and stuff like that. So just if you can be disciplined about it, that can be really amazing. Um, imagine if you're a young class, I mean, this is why things are advancing so fast and not just guitar playing, by the way. But, um, you know, if you're a young classical guitar player, the idea that you could uh, uh, watch Segovia play on your laptop all weekend you know, is amazing, you know um that that could be that could be really beneficial so just again just have the des discipline that you don't also click on the thing that has little kittens being shot out of you know <laughs> t-shirt cannons or something too um <laughs> right <laughs> yeah any other uh questions about um practice i guess uh, well random things uh get up early if you can that's that's i said that earlier but i just i just want to say that again like do the hardest work I always tell my students do the worst first, you know, do the, if, if you got to do scales or something like that, you know, just, just knock it out of the way. Um, a reminder from earlier in the conversation, if you learn any exercises, scales, anything like that, I'm not a big fan of too many exercises and scales and things, but when you, but we do need those, but fold it into your repertoire. Just be thinking about your, your list of tunes and, and get it in there. Don't spend too much time practicing stuff into the thin air. If you can practice it in the context of a tune, or even if you're just kind of practicing with the metronome, so you're practicing in the context of time, but just kind of random lick playing and stuff. I do it too, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it it's 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 different. Your brain just doesn't have the reason to to hold on to it. Anyway, I guess I'm repeating myself, but those are the things I feel kind of the most strongly about. Uh, yeah, uh, really want to thank you for that. It's um, it's really inspiring. It's it, it's funny. I, I, I've been thinking about the way that I, I play as you're talking, and I play Wildwood Flower every time I pick up the guitar. Nice. And I'm getting pretty good at it. Wow! <laughs> you know, Who would have thought? Yeah, it? <laughs> practice it works. <laughs> Who knew? But um, it, 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 I, I find little things in there that all of a sudden I go, "Oh, that's how he did that," because everybody's covered that song yeah in the world and everybody's played it a little bit differently yeah and you and, hear and, those differences because you you've practiced this it's like bill evans thing one tune for 24 hours i mean just as you know in general and you've got that one tune down yeah so someone it, it, moves one note and you're like oh that was cool or that, i'm glad it, i do it my way or whatever or I, you know yeah yeah it, it's um expansion through limitation i'm sure that's the fourth or fifth time i've said that but that's you know having one guitar putting having a 12th fret and a, a capo on the fifth fret wow now i've only got you know this 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 big of a fretboard i think i'm going to live there all morning and see what happens you know just kind of going deeper into it rather than just kind of you know i don't know i think i need a stratocaster now i think i'm going to play some hendrix like wait a minute <laughs> I wonder who's got real Russian tubes. You know, I mean, like, like I don't know. You just got to see that beast looming up and yeah, just get beast, back into like that beast uh, is ugly. Yeah, it, that it's beast ugly. is it's I and now more than ever. <laughs> so let's uh, make sure that everybody knows kind of what's been going on with Eric. He's uh, just released another Jamie Stillway project that is truly dream worthy it's it, it, it's fantastic it's two really great players 
Um, anything I, you just, you just played a little bit with Tim. Um, mm-hmm. you just did a show with Tim. Yeah. Uh, in that kind of thing, but anything else coming up or. Well, I think this, the thing, the new, the new album, um, um, over the waterfall with Jamie is, is, you know, that's fresh on my mind. And, and, um, so that's kind of my main thing right now. I think we're going to do some more shows that I'll be updating the calendar, but I know we have some stuff mainly just in the Pacific Northwest, but we're going to really shoot in 2023 to get more across the country, um, get down in California and, and, and whatnot. So I think that's probably my main thing. Um, I'm working on a, on a, on a new album of solo fingerstyle guitar that's not jazz. It's going to be um, kind of like these sort of fingers, these sort of fiddly tuned music, but played fingerstyle. And I've got a lot of original stuff. So I'm kind of doing a book CD project with that. Well, probably not, I don't know about the CD part, but you get the idea. Music and printed page. Um, so I imagine that, you know, I, I can imagine there's going to be a period coming up not too long where I start doing more gigs solo guitar again um tim and i haven't really talked about doing anything but we do the occasional gig uh mark and i same thing um but kind of mainly a lot of jamie stillway stuff for now i'm just really into that and that's my that's my main thing um but then this book when i have uh you know when i buy the fireplace with my laptop early in the morning like i was this morning so uh everybody knows how to get in contact with eric through his website um, if you're looking for a teacher, um, I think you're still taking students. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I, we're always open for new victims over here. <laughs> and well, uh, I, I, I want to, I want to. Yeah, give Zoom a, is a, Zoom. I have more room for Zoom. I think for the local Portland thing, I'm kind of running into a waiting list situation right now. But I, um, but um, but for the Zoom, I have a different. You know, different days that I do those and, and I'm happy to help on uh, Zoom. I, I, I want to give you a shout out to something you said when we first started talking about this whole this whole thing. You talked about headphones. Yeah. And how important they are. And truth be told, I mixed a gig with incredibly difficult situations in a very short period of time to work it out. And by God, and I had the phones on the whole time. And when I mixed it and put it to video, I kept the phones on. I would normally have not done that. I would have gone to my speakers, but your thing about about mixing it with the phones, it sounds damn good. Yeah, again, well, I don't wanna, you know, conflate our two uh, <laughs> deep dive uh, podcast episodes here, but, but rewinding a bit, for people who might be curious, like, what, what are they talking about now? Yeah, I just, I feel personally that like in mixing and recording, but also in appreciation of music, Absolutely. the headphones can be really powerful. It's, it's a good place to put your money um, as someone who's into really listening or, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm kind of wishy-washy here with the recording and mixing thing because uh, the environment in which we listen colors things so much that to really so you could buy if you got a lot of dough and you buy a five six seven which is very easy thousand dollar set of monitors and you're sitting in front of them and you're thinking well that's it i did it (laughs) but you are pumping (laughs) sound into a room that is completely you know uh, distorting that to some degree or another. So you're still looking at things through a funhouse mirror, unless you really put, you know, several thousand more, uh, or you have a, just a huge room that the, the room is not factoring in, but you set, spend a lot more uh, money getting the room uh, professionally tuned, you know, the right amount of absorbance and, and diffusion to get a room. So it truly is measurably uh, neutral now your speakers are really telling you what to hear most people can't do that um so if you take a little bit of that money like maybe 500 dollars or something like get sort of a nicer prosumer because by the way you can spend more like two grand on headphones too but it's a lot more affordable now now you've sort of eliminated the room you've eliminated the you know you're just sort of wearing your studio um so some people are going to disagree. Some of my favorite mixers now, like Andrew Sheps is one of my heroes. He's kind of more in the rock world. He does everything, everything in headphones. 
and you just have to train your ear, right? So you should listen to records that you love, you know, with uh, headphones on, so that because it is affecting your stereo image, right? Because <laughs> you know, totally. there's no middle. There really is no middle. There's that's your skull and brain, by the way. A bunch of blood and guts there in the middle, right? As opposed to the sort of phantom middle that happens when you have two speakers. So it is a different thing. But if you if you can if you can tune your ear or train your ear by listening to records that you've known forever and loved. It's great. But the bottom line, uh, sewing it back up, believe it or not, with um, uh, practice <laughs> and listening and appreciating music is the headphones are an immersive experience. It, it's, if you go, I do this a lot. If I walk down the street with big headphones on, I know I, really, I look kind of ridiculous compared to everybody else with ear pods and sunglasses. I'm kind of in my own little thing, you know, and um, that can be a great way to listen to an album. I mean, really, if you haven't done that in a while, get some great headphones and go for a 45 minute walk, because that's about what a typical album is and crank it up and, and just remember what that's like and turn off all your effing notifications. Just don't, you know, so assuming your music on a phone, turn all that shit off. You'll be OK. You'll be OK for the world will wait 45 more minutes. I'm just saying this out loud for myself here, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how we went down that rabbit hole. Anyway, I got to go have lunch. I'm sure I've exhausted my stay and worn everyone out. No, never, never. We, we, we would love to talk to you anytime you have the time in between uh, all your other activities and projects. And yes, oh, thank man. you so much for, uh, taking the time to talk to us. All so right. Well, it's great to, to see talk you to you again. guys. Yeah. It's great to see great. you too, man. And right. uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, catch up. I think I'm going to be up in Portland in mid uh, April with Tim for okay. a couple for a couple days. So we'll catch up. Okay, man. And that dog is bigger. The dog is bigger. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> he's bigger. It's a pony. <laughs> it is a pony. Wow. Uh, thanks so much, Eric. Really appreciate it. All right, over now. Uh, everybody, have a good day. Later. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this installment of the Santa Cruz Coffee Break. For more music-related fun, please join the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum at scgcpf or santacruzguitarplayers.com. If you have any questions or possible podcast topics, please contact us. If you have a product or service that you feel would be of value to our listeners, please consider adding your support and keeping the coffee pot on. Contact us for more information. We ask that you hit the like, follow, bell, or bookmark buttons so we can keep you informed of upcoming podcast episodes. We hope you enjoyed Santa Cruz Coffee Break. Now it's time to go play your guitar. <laughs>